beyond the thoughts we made of death. Uh, the death wish of the ego, which Freud called Thanatos, but it's we know it as a as an attempt, and and we could say that it comes in different forms. Um, psychologically, sometimes people do have thoughts of committing suicide, or it could just be it can come in forms of uh, of attack, depression, sadness, envy, jealousy. You know any feeling that is not supremely happy is part of the death wish. And when we think of suicide in this world, we think of, of taking one's life in terms of form. But the more we work with a teaching like A Course in Miracles, it's saying that, that any unloving thought, any feeling that is slightly irritating, annoying, upsetting, even in the slightest degree, is just a thin veil drawn over intense fury. And the ego and that dark ontological guilt is that intense fury. And we could say rage would be another example of that. So sometimes people have asked me in different countries to talk about suicide. And, and you might remember from the clips, the montage that Jason did, uh, he, near the end he said, oh, he knows he's going to die. And Jason said, it's a decision that even when we seem to lay the body aside, it's nothing more than a decision. Uh, in this world, overtly, when people seem to take their own life, that's called suicide. And if somebody gets uh, hit by a truck or hit by a bus or something, it's, unless they're purposely walking out in front of it, we have these different categories for death in this world. Some are called accidents, and some are called suicides, some are called, oh, he died so peacefully, or she died in her sleep. Oh, they always say, that's the best way to die. <laughs> yeah. They even call it dying naturally. Somehow, if you put those two words together, die and naturally, <laughs> it doesn't fit very well. But there's all these variations for death. Some are called suicides, accidents, and so on and so forth, dying naturally. Everything is a decision. Um, we could say that uh, even in this world, Jesus tells us in the Course, it is impossible that anything should come to me unbidden by myself. Even in this world. So we're not just talking about the Kingdom of Heaven. We're not just talking about the split mind. We're not just talking about how you choose your emotions. but even in this world, it is impossible that anything should come to me unbidden by myself. This mind is so powerful that it is drawing everything. And, um, you know, Jesus says in the Course that, that um, the power of decision is my own. He's basically saying that everything that seems to occur in the world is, is by your decision. And he say, says that you may think this is impossible or too all-encompassing to be the truth, but he comes back and says, but there are no uh, compromises in this. There, there are no, really there are no big decisions and small decisions. We could say that to accept the atonement for yourself and to accept the resurrection and to accept the atonement in Course in Miracles terms would see a, seem to be a higher order decision than the decisions about what to wear or what to eat and you know who to go out with and all those things that seem to be form decisions. It seems to be a higher order decision. But I would say that atonement is, is not so much making a new decision, it's accepting the correction that has already been given. It's more of an acceptance than like a new decision. So really all you're doing when you're going for self-realization and enlightenment is you're bringing yourself deeper into your mind to see the real alternatives, uh, which is the whole section on the real alternatives. And one is a life wish, we could call that forgiveness, and one is a death wish, we could call that the ego. In heaven there is no life wish or death wish, there's just eternal life. But in this world, when the mind has 
put itself in the impossible situation of opposites. And we say impossible situation because in heaven there are no opposites, it's just pure oneness. So this is a world that is an impossible situation by the way that it's set up. And in the workbook we're told that, that even heaven must seem to take the form of, of a choice in this world, a decision in this world, because you believe in choice and you believe in opposites, so heaven has to take the form that you can recognize. Abstraction is completely pushed out of awareness, so we're going down towards that life wish, that decision for, for resurrection. And the prerequisite for accepting the correction is to see the problem exactly as it is, meaning to see the death wish as in your mind. It's not, sometimes people say, oh, that was so egoic behavior. You know, there is no egoic behavior, just like there is no really saintly behavior, because that's, that's again trying to take the attributes of the mind, right-mindedness and wrong-mindedness, and project them off onto form and see them as if they are behaviors. Even when we see somebody who we think of as a saint, and we see them, their calm, peaceful eyes, you know, as Jesus says in the workbook, their, their forehead is serene, they have a smile on their face, you know, so forth. You know, even those are just behaviors. Those aren't going to bring about that, that release. You have to go inside. So you have to see the problem exactly as it is, which is, it's a perceptual problem. That's why when I go around all these different groups, you know, I know course groups are popular, 12-step groups and this and that. Like 12-step groups, they go around, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic, an addict, I say they could, could go around, hi, my name is so-and-so, and, -so and I'm, I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> and this cannot be reinforced too much. So you could do this every week. Maybe your meet, group meets twice a week. Hi, my name is so-and-so, I have a perceptual problem. It's a good way to start everything off. Because, because if you don't believe you have a perceptual problem, then you start taking all these specific problems, like drugs and alcohols, and relationship problems, and finance problems, and sickness problems, you take them all seriously. And you take them all seriously because it has been forgotten, oh, I have a perceptual problem. I'm seeing something that's not even there, I'm hallucinating, I'm psychotic, uh, I've had a total break from reality, which is abstract love and light. So I'm schizophrenic, I'm hearing voices that aren't real voices, I'm seeing images that really aren't real images, so, so believe me, if you're psychotic and you're schizophrenic and you don't even know it, you're delusional then. So you're psychotic, schizophrenic and delusional and you need to first come to the admission that you have a perceptual problem before you can have it corrected. You know, it's, it's just there's no way, even if the answers are given to you and you have angels coming down with white, big fluffy white wings and playing harps, it's still not going to do you any good as long as you haven't admitted you have a perceptual problem. Even if Mother Mary comes to you, even if Jesus comes to you and sits on the end of your bed and smiles at you for an hour, uh, it, won't, it won't even matter. Because until you come to the admission that you have a perceptual problem, that you are not seeing clearly, that you have a distortion going on, you aren't going to be willing to accept the answer, even though the answer is already there. The answer has always been there. The answer was given the instant that the separation seemed to occur. The answer was given. Jesus says in the Course, there are many answers you have received but have not heard. In other words, the Holy Spirit in your mind has received them all. And that means even for what you perceive as specific problems, if you think you've got a specific problem like you're hungry or you're pregnant or you're poor or you can't pay the money that you owe somebody or whatever, then the Spirit will answer you in a way that can bring healing relief. Even in this world, a, a world of specifics, the echoes of that glorious answer can reach you in a beautiful aha moment, which is really just a guidance. Like you're told, oh here's, 
here's what I want you to do. If you find yourself in a pit, the Spirit will speak to you and say, here's what I want you to do next. You know, it could just be pray. <laughs> it could just be wait. Wait a moment, you know, but the answer is always given to whatever you perceive the problem is until you realize that all your problems are the same problem. That the problems really aren't many. It's just a singular problem and that's what Jesus calls looking at the real alternative. You have to see the real alternatives side by side before you can make a, an intelligent <laughs> informed choice. You're not going to make an informed choice between uh, the forgiveness in your mind and a choice in the world because as long as you pick a choice in the world, you are not ready to accept the correction. One of the best examples of that, has anybody here seen the Matrix trilogy, the three Matrix movies? In the second Matrix movie, close to the end of it, Neo meets the architect, and the architect has a lot of uh, intellectual mumbo-jumbo to say to him, but basically he does tell him, there are two doors. The door to your right leads back to the source, and the door to your left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix, <laughs> the world. If the whole choice between Trinity and the Matrix and the door to the right, the source, is the choice between thinking that you still have to go back to the world and save somebody. And you can see as soon as the architect gives him that choice, he gets a real tense face. Like, Don't mess with my woman. I'm going to go save her. She needs me. <laughs> I'm going to. It's the Prince Charming thing. It just, it just gets him every time. You know, you've got salvation. <laughs> The door to the right is the source, leads back to the source, and immediately, you know, his face gets very tense and, and you know, he is going to go back and rescue Trinity. And think about it, it doesn't matter whether it's rescuing Trinity, it's rescuing the, the dolphins, the whales, the rainforest, uh, the environment, rescuing the, the Earth's environment rescuing Mother Earth from all the trash and pollution that the humans are doing, rescuing a tree, rescuing a dog, rescuing a kitty cat, rescuing, rescuing anything. You know, in, in psychological terms, a lot of people go to psychotherapists, you know, because they've got a big rescuing problem. They've been rescuing, rescuing their whole life, trying to save something. And Jesus comes along in A Course in Miracles and he says, only the mind can be salvaged, and it is salvaged only through peace. One sentence is his answer to rescuing something in the world. Only the mind needs to be salvaged. If it's a fragmented mind, if it's a mind that believes in separation and it's looking out on a fragmented world, it's seeing a splintered world, that's a problem. Why? Because that's not reality. The mind was created perfect. The mind was created whole. The mind was created to create. The mind was created to extend. The mind was created in peace, as peace. And a fragmented world is not natural to the Christ. It's not natural to God. It's not natural to our identity. So the next time you're tempted to go rescue something and save something, you just have to realize, oh yeah, it's my mind is where I need the resurrection. It's my mind that needs the salvation. And so really what we have is the Holy Spirit has one, we'll say, big convincing job to, to work with the sleeping mind who's perceiving all these images and still trying to rescue people, things, animals, you know, environmental concerns. It's just always trying to save something in the world and that is what is preventing it from accepting its own salvation. It starts to get more and more to the point where you feel like, like when you feel sad and depressed about this world in any way, you know, you can say, well, what I'm sad about is just, is, is just a projection of my own mind. I'm still feeling deprived. I'm still feeling lacking. I'm still feeling like I'm missing something and actually 
I'm not, but I have to see the problem exactly where it is. So that, with, with suicidal thoughts or the death wish that we're talking about, the key is, is starting to really go inside and face that belief in lack. You know, to face that darkness, to allow that darkness to come up. And even that will be guided, you know, that's why, you know, it seems recently you've come across, Serena, lots of mighty companions that are there. Those are just reflections of, of your own willingness to face the darkness, to allow the darkness to come up. To see that when you allow that darkness to come up, you won't be crushed beneath it. You won't be swallowed by the darkness. You won't be destroyed by that darkness. As intense as that darkness feels, it's like you're yourself giving yourself permission to say, No, I am worthy of healing. I am worthy of moving through this darkness. I have mighty companions around me that are there, that are reflections of my own willingness. God's will for me is perfect happiness. God's plan for me cannot fail. And no, we can't remind ourselves <laughs> of that last one enough. God's plan for me cannot fail, cannot fail, cannot fail. Even when the darkness comes and sets in very heavy, cannot fail, cannot fail. You know, that's what allows us to keep going, to keep, to keep allowing it up. It can seem like, like an endless tunnel, like, like it's a very dark, dark tunnel, but there is a light at the end of that tunnel. And the faith is, is keep coming inward, deeper and deeper inward towards the correction and hanging in there, you know, when the temptation is to, to try to break away in some way, you know, to, to bring an end to this crazy world. But the world is not escaped through death, the world is escaped through life and through resurrection. Uh, even on people's gravestones they put R.I.P. Rest in Peace. Yeah. You know, that's a wish, you know, for, from all those to what seems to be the departed or the, the deceased is the prayer of the heart is rest in peace. You know, rest in that state of mind that you were created in. You know, rest in what will last forever. Uh, that's really, it's a beautiful prayer that they put onto gravestones. So we're with you. You're not alone. Just want the light, that's all. It's very simple. Yeah. I remember that movie uh, Susan Sarandon was in and Sean Penn, Dead Man Walking. So powerful, very powerful. The very final scenes of him, you know, going off to the to the chair and her coming to his side and just looking at him and just staring into his eyes and saying, you know, you know, I want this to be the the last, you know, the last thing that you see, this, you know, just this presence of love and innocence, you know, it was this presence of fearlessness, you know, almost like saying you can walk through anything, that even an electric chair, you know, you need not be afraid and, and presence of love. I want the presence of love to be the last thing that you, you see, the last thing you're aware of. And, you know, to really feel like that's what Christ is whispering to us all the time, as we're tempted to, to see things and to, f to face things that are not really of our Creator. You know, there's this healing presence, this balm inside that's saying, I want the presence of love to be the last thing that you see. It will be the last thing. It's like that song, Just when I thought my chance had passed, you go and save the best for last. Yeah, that's a good thought. <laughs>
especially when you're facing adversity and pain and fear, or psychological, you know, it's great to keep that in mind. You go and you go and save the best for last. Even Helen Schuckman, the scribe of the Course, um, seemed to have some really dark, bitter days right near the end of her life. And she was really fighting it out, and it was very, very intense. And uh, Ken Wapnick and her husband Louis had left the hospital, and then they, you know, after they had left her, uh, they got the call that she had passed. But when they went back, and remember Ken telling the story that when he went back in and saw her, she had this soft little faint smile on her face at the end after that bitter fight and struggle. And all Ken could feel was, mm, Jesus came for her, kept his promise. You know, that was, that's the thing. It's this undoing of the ego is, is really full on. I mean, you're, you're actually facing what has been pushed and pressed out of awareness for a millennium. And now, in this so-called lifetime, you know, it's like you're saying, enough. Enough already. Let's, let's face this. Let's let it come up. Let's hand it over to the light and let's be healed of this for once and forever and for all. And that's very courageous, you know. That's especially once you begin to get an awareness of what you're doing. You know, facing the unconscious darkness, letting that come up is no small thing. Some of you have probably read some of the, the writings of the mystics and the saints, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa. You know, it's not easy reading because they're talking about how dismal, how desperate, you know, how daunting, you know, staggering, you know, the, these are the kind of the things, St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul, you know, it is black. Um, these, these were reports of saying like, whoa, just in case you're going to think of doing this too, <laughs> I just want to report to everybody what this is about. <laughs> in case you're you're going to go on this journey and you know in one sense they were like early early roadmaps for others that aspired to to be still and know god and now with the course in miracles we just say you have a very clear roadmap it's a very complete map it's not like a a treasure map that part of it's the corner of it's ripped off you get to this point like uh oh <laughs> Like some, somehow you're in a Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones movie. Ah, <laughs> I've come this far and the, the map is torn. <laughs> there's, a, there's a corner ripped off here. Ah, you know, but it's actually a very complete road map. It's complete with lots of pep talks. I call them spiritual pep talks, where he goes into your mind like a dentist drilling down t to get a cavity. <laughs> And he's doing the Roto-Rooter thing. He's talking about <laughs> blood and the shines like rubies and sepulchers and painting rosy lips on a skeleton and some pretty. He's just he's just like taking you down like a, like a like a dentist drilling down to fill a cavity and then and then pep talk, pep talk, pep talk. Just like the dentist takes a pause, puts the mask over you or Gives you another big shot of Novocaine or something. It's like, come on, we're going down deep here. There's another. After you've gone a few levels down, you see the big needle coming. Come on, bring it in there. Bring that big. You know, it's. But these are like pep talks, pep talks, pep talks, all the way through, to to remind you, hang in there, hang in there. You know, stay with me, stay with me.